Welcome to Sisters Inc., our podcast for and about women entrepreneurs, brought to you by Black Enterprise. I'm your host, Elisa Gums. Black women are the fastest growing group of entrepreneurs in America. And on every episode of Sisters Inc., we'll sit down with one successful CEO and share how she slays the challenges of being a Black woman in business. Today's episode is all about telling your story. We're chatting with Fawn Weaver, the CEO of Uncle Nearest Premium Whiskey, about how an article in a newspaper started her on the journey to co-founding the company and how she continues to use her skills as a storyteller, both to grow the brand and to cement the legacy of the best whiskey maker the world never knew. Welcome to Sisters Inc. Fawn. Thank and you. Thank you so much for sitting down with us. Yeah, thank you for having me. I love the story of how you came to learn about Uncle Nearest. To me, it's like a lightning strike. Um, and in your own words, you say it flipped your life upside down. Absolutely. So tell everyone the origin. Oh, the origin was I was in Singapore with my husband. And on the cover of the New York Times International Edition, there's a, a photo of a uh, really mostly all white men in this photo. And it's a turn of the century photo. About 1904 is where we now date it. But the center of the photo is an African-American man. And to the right of him, if you're looking at the photo, is Jack Daniel, the distiller and, and the man whose name we know around the world. And the, the headline of the story was Jack Daniels embraces a hidden ingredient help from a slave. And so obviously that captured my attention. Like I think it captured most people's attentions, most African-American in, in particular. I just am a bit of a, a nerd in terms of history and my husband calls it my rabbit holes. Mm -hmm. So I have, I'll start researching something and it's just, I do it for fun. I'll start researching something and two hours later, I've like discovered everything there was to know about whatever this subject matter was. In this instance, there was a book that one of someone online had referenced called Jack Daniels Legacy. So I ordered the book and it was his biography written in 1967, height of the civil rights era. And you had a white reporter from Tuscaloosa, Alabama that came to Lynchburg, Tennessee to write the definitive biography of Jack Daniel. Then who was at that time and still is the most famous American whiskey maker. Mm -hmm. Well, after the story came out because of the headline, instead of people taking the time to figure out what the actual story was, that headline got ripped from that and became sensationalized. And then all of a sudden, what the reporter and the journalist did not say in the article, people just jumped to that conclusion. So all of a sudden, uh, Jack Daniel was a slave owner and Nearest was his slave and he stole the recipe and he hid Nearest and all the rest of the he, stuff. Whole story. Oh, made it. it was a, I mean, it was quite big too. And I mean, it was literally all around the world where y you had this story that people had taken as fact. Well, I get the biography and I start flipping through the pages and very early on, it start talk, starts talking about Uncle Nearest. Now, this is a biography on Jack Daniel, 1967. You didn't have to mention, you didn't have to credit an African-American. Right. And you're talking about a formerly enslaved man. You certainly didn't have to name a slave. If anything, you'd say a colored person or you know a Negro or, or whatever. That was what you did in books during that time. And so as I flipped through the pages over and over again, it was Nearest Green, Uncle Nearest, and his two sons, George and Eli. And they were mentioned so many times in Jack's biography, more times than his own family, Wow! that I began looking at this very different and saying, I, I think social media and, and the press, how they've now taken this story and made it evolve into something negative, I think they actually may be wrong. And because I typically go through life looking for all that is great, looking for love. I, I am an optimist, but I, I like to say I'm a realistic optimist, meaning I'm not an optimist that's just waiting for stuff to come to me. I'm an optimist that's out there and believes that I can make anything happen. Mm -hmm. And so I'm looking at this and going, this isn't a story of hope. This is a story of these folks somehow back in the 1800s figured out how to have blacks and whites next to each other even though everything else in the South was not what they were creating there in this little small town. So I got on a plane and I went to Lynchburg to figure it out. Let's, let's <laughs> talk about that because, you know, most people, they read a story, they've got a question, they Google it. Yeah. 
you ordered a book. Yes. So you, you've already taken one step. It's yes. not like, you know, your job is investigating this story. Right. You were an entrepreneur. You were a real estate investor. Sure. You were an author. Sure. Um, and you fell down, as your husband calls it, a rabbit hole. I yeah. think from the outside, some people would say that this became a bit of an obsession. <laughs> you, I've heard you, that. You've heard that I've once heard or that. twice? I've heard that. As you said, you got on a plane. You, you spent thousands of hours yeah. digging up his story. You collected 10,000 documents and artifacts from across six states. Mm -hmm. You spoke to 100 of Uncle Nearest's relatives. Mm -hmm. And you hired 20 different experts, right. such as archaeologists, genealogists. I mean, I still have some of them hired even now, continuing do. to do the work. Yeah. What what was it like falling down the rabbit hole of this story? It was a beautiful thing because I showed up in Lynchburg, Tennessee. And as you can imagine, so my husband, six foot four, African-American, he was not interested in going to a town with Lynch in the name at all. He don't want to be it in, in Virginia, not in Tennessee. Zero desire. Done. <laughs> and 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 it was really hard to get him. And the only reason I got him there is because it was my 40th birthday. And I very rarely take time off. I observe the Sabbath. Outside of that, I just work and I love what I do. Always have. And so for me, my birthday, I can't just not do anything. I still have to be doing something. It's just how I'm wired. Mm -hmm. And so this just seemed like something fun to do for my birthday. And you can't tell your wife she can't do what she wants to do for her 40th sure birthday. Can. It just, you just can't. <laughs> and so he went along with it as, I mean, as much as he didn't want to, he went along with it. And when we arrived in Lynchburg, immediately, I mean, and I mean immediately, within two hours, we met who was now Jack's eldest descendant at the time. It was his second eldest descendant. But the way things unfolded when we got there, it was very clear that both families wanted the story told. Neither one of the families were the reason why it hadn't been told, and both families were wanting someone to be able to piece this together. Mm -hmm. And I just happened to be the person who showed up. Honestly, I think if someone else had shown up and they could have absolutely done the same thing. I don't think there's anything unique about me. I think the only thing that's unique in how I approached it is that I completely disregarded, discarded everything that I had seen online, social media, in the press, every single thing and said, I wanna see what this story is from scratch. I have no judgment about any of the people here. Don't like the town's name, but I have no judgment about the people here. And I think because of that, people sensed that. And all of a sudden they were opening up their homes and pulling out documents that have been in basements and attics for 50, 60, 70 years. And the entire town helped me to piece this together. Well, on that note, we're going to take a quick break yeah. so we can uh, adjust our crowns. I'll here. take it. I'll take and, it. And we'll be right back. 2020 marks the 15th anniversary of the Black Enterprise Women of Power Summit, hosted by ADP, where executive women of color, business leaders, and entrepreneurs share their incredible journey to help you succeed with yours. Every single day I wake up, I hustle. Join us March 5th through the 8th at the Mirage in Las Vegas. For more information, log on to blackenterprise.com slash WPS. Be there. Welcome back to Sisters Inc. We're talking with Fawn Weaver. So you were just telling us about how you discovered the story of, yeah. of Uncle Nearest. You didn't set out to start a whiskey company. No. Um, but the last time we spoke, you said that you knew once it was a possibility that in order to launch the brand the quote unquote right way, yeah. you would need to raise about $20 million. I would need to, that is the bare minimum. Right. <laughs> Which is no small <laughs> sum. It's not a small sum, but that literally to do what we're doing, that is the bare, the bare minimum. I mean, we had to raise more than twice that. And at, at some point later down the line, I'll probably do a Series C. It just is the nature of growing in this business. So so tell us what that fundraising process was like for you and how you leveraged your story to do it. Because yeah. I would imagine that telling this story is a huge part of securing investors. Absolutely. Well, I think, and this is across the board, when people would sit with me, and I think that this is the piece that entrepreneurs miss when they go out and raise money because I hear so often that there's there's no there's no money to be raised. It's very difficult. I hear a lot for African Americans to to raise money. And you know this and I think we talked about this, that I am a person who I think at this point has raised forty something million dollars. I didn't give up one vote. I didn't give up one seat. It's not that it is 
as difficult as we think. I think that we think it's difficult. And anything that we think is difficult or impossible, we set up our own sort of boundaries and we don't realize that's what we're doing. For me, when I sat across from everyone, I did it with no fear because if they said no, I was just going to go to the next one. I was going to keep doing it until I got the yes. And once I got the yes, then I was going to have that yes take me to the next yes and have that yes take me to the next yes. And that's the nature of of raising money. Once you get one person who believes in you, they will take you to someone else who they know will also believe in you. And so it was just a matter of getting in front of the right people. And I started off with friends and family, those who I knew, this is a very risky investment. Mm -hmm. So those who I knew, uh, if they lost it, would still be okay. And that's, that's key. And I only I only raised money from high net worth individuals. And so no private equity, no venture capitalists. And what that allowed me to do is literally to get to know people and to then sit with them and say, okay, so you know what it is that I am trying to do. You know my passion behind this. Who else will be excited about it? Not just to put their money in, but to help me build this brand. And so my group of investors, I call them our six man because they literally are out helping us build this brand every single day. And so it's not just anyone who wanted to put in money. They couldn't just put it in. I had to know that they were going to actually help me build this brand. And what is the story of the brand that you crafted for those first investors? Yeah, well, you know what? I think it is almost uh, to a certain degree what you and I just talked about is that there was this remarkable story that was always meant to be told. And it was the story of, of love, of unity, of honor during a period of time when we don't expect to see it. I don't know any other American story in which we have seen this before, where you have an African-American and a white man in a town with the lynch in, the name, in a Southern town in which African-Americans are paid on tenure, in which a, an African-American who was formerly enslaved becomes the wealthiest African-American in the area immediately following the Civil War, but then he's wealthier than his white neighbors. We just haven't seen something like this before. and so. I looked at it less of about the whiskey. When I sat down, I might talk about the whiskey for all of two minutes. What I spent the entire time talking about is how America needed this story and they needed it right now. And the vehicle to deliver this story and to deliver what I believed to be a healing bomb for what we're dealing with right now just happened to be a whiskey. It could have been anything else. Right. But because this story was of an African-American master distiller, obviously it had to be whiskey. So you now have the fastest growing independent whiskey brand in, in US, US history. history. Yep. Yes, and it, it's won more than 50 awards. We're now at, as of last night, we won World's Best Again. We are now at 78. 78 in two and a half awards years. in two and a half years. Yeah. So let's talk about um, the fact that you're not only independent, but you're an outsider. It's not like you had a bunch of I was an outsider. You I think were. folks now yeah. will tell you I'm not an outsider anymore. <laughs> right. Yes. Um, you know, but in an industry that's notoriously hard mm -hmm. for um, new brands to break through in. Yeah. And you're doing it as a woman. Yeah. Well, I just happened to be that, so I kind of didn't have another option. <laughs> <laughs> that's true, but you've said that, you know, part of your job is to, um, you know, convince the team that you guys can do anything the big boys can do except backwards and in high heels. Absolutely. And Absolutely. so how did you manage this breakthrough? You know, I told someone, one of our team members yesterday, I, I said, you know, I think what confuses people is we're like those little dogs who yap at the big dogs <laughs> because they don't realize they're little. I said, you know, we came into this industry and everyone thought we were little and we thought we were big out the gate. And I think we had that approach. And so what we've essentially done in our company is manifest what we thought we were to begin with. Mm -hmm. Day one, when we began talking about this brand, it was never a very like, oh, it's going to be small and it's going to. No, no. Day one, we were like, we're building out a 50 million dollar distillery. <laughs> you know, it is. There's a certain aspects of this that I almost feel like. We, we spoke into existence, but then we, we put forth an extraordinary effort to make it happen, to piece everything together. But I never once looked at the fact that I was a woman, other than 
some folks didn't take my calls initially. And so which, I bet they're taking them now. Oh, my gosh. Well, the fun, <laughs> the fun part is, is I get I got uh, I get a lot of venture capitalists and, and private equity people that send me emails constantly. And when their people can't get it to me, then it goes to the CEO. So then I get the emails from the CEOs and I ignore all of them. And so there was this one that said another one says, I'm following up. And so I literally responded and said, received. Thank you for following up. Zero interest. Send. And it, it is because I recognize what I am building and who I want a part of what I am building. And I think that my greatest asset in this, in building this, has been my ability to say no and to say mm. it confidently and to not think twice about it. Right or wrong, didn't matter. If I didn't feel like this is what was going to help us to build the brand to make sure it's still here and still growing 200 years from now, I would simply say no and see where, where the chips fell. So I just want to end by bringing it full circle because you yeah. are continuing to tell the story of Uncle Nearest in so many ways. You mentioned the distillery, yeah. um, which you're opening, uh, well, which you opened in September, yeah, but yeah. you are expanding. Yes. Um, you've also produced a short film yes. about Uncle Nearest with Jeffrey Wright. Yeah. Um, and you are working on the literal legacy because the company does so much for the descendants of Uncle Nearest. Yeah. Um, does, I don't know if everyone knows what you do, though. I don't think anybody does because we don't really talk about it it because we don't do it to sell right but it was always a part of the very beginning we began paying even before the first bottle ever went out the door we began paying for all of nearest descendants to go to college so if they're undergraduate graduate law school getting their phd doesn't matter if they're college age if they are in college they have a full ride from us wow that is amazing Thank you so much, Fawn, for you. sharing your small business success story with us. Everyone out there, please explore the story for yourself yeah. at UncleNearest.com and follow them on social media at UncleNearest. And uh, while you're doing things, please check out the podcast channel on BlackEnterprise.com to find Sisters, Inc. and other podcasts from Black Enterprise editors, writers, and experts. Be sure to subscribe to Sisters, Inc. on iTunes, SoundCloud, Spotify, or YouTube. And if you like what you hear, show your love by leaving us a five-star review and put a sister on by spreading the word. This is Elisa Gums with Sisters, Inc. for Black Enterprise. Thank you for listening. <laughs>